Welcome to What's New, the program packed full of news and stories just for you. I'm Debula, coming up on this program. After years living next to a volcano, thousands of Congolese children have had their lives dramatically changed by its eruption. I don't know what happened to my family. My family went on a truck, but I don't know whether they found refuge in Sake too. Can you tell the difference between real and fake medicines? This week we meet someone who can help keep you safe. Does it matter to you if African art can't be viewed on the continent? I would say yes, because in the end, it is our history. I used to go to museums, but I didn't see much African art. So I didn't really know it. Saidina and Andre in Senegal will tell us why the return of this sword should only be a fast step. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Debula. Now, can you imagine what it's like to live near a volcano? Most of the time, everything is fine and the land is fertile. But occasionally there's an eruption, like what's happened recently in Goma, in the eastern DR Congo. Thousands of families were taken by surprise and had to flee their homes in the city to escape the lava which was coming down from Mount Niragongo, one of the world's most active volcanoes. The government now says displaced people can start returning to Goma as volcanic activity has decreased. But for many teenagers, life will never be the same. Some of them told what's new about their experience. The sky was red, so red. I was like, what is this? Since the earthquakes, I hardly sleep anymore. Earthquakes? It's scary. It's like you're dancing, but without music. Just like Karen and Trezor, many children in Goma in the Democratic Republic of Congo have had their first experience of one of the most dangerous volcano eruptions in the world. The last time it happened here was in 2002. It was my first time. I was afraid. I saw the people who live next to the volcanic eruption, a place called Buhene, starting to come out. I saw people coming out of the other side, running away with their things. I heard people talking, saying, the volcanic eruption is here. Let's run. Let's run away from our houses. Let's evacuate everywhere. On May 22nd, the volcano Mount Niragongo erupted, reaching the outskirts of Goma. It's a city of two million people. Nearly half a million had to flee. I was told the volcanic eruption was coming, so I packed my things and fled like the others. When there is an eruption in the city of Goma, you have to be prepared to leave because you can't know where it will explode. When the volcano erupted, we were all scared at home, and we went to Sake to take refuge. According to the UN agency, over 1,000 children went missing following the eruption. I found myself here in this center thanks to an association operating in Sake. I don't know what happened to my family. My family went on a truck but I don't know whether they found refuge in Sake too. We've put a program together to help us identify those children who've been separated from their families. About 75% of them have already been reunited with their families and we're doing everything possible to reunite the last ones who are still apart from their families. Partial evacuations have continued because of ongoing safety fears. So how well prepared were young people for this event and the evacuation plan? 
I was already taught at school how to escape a volcanic eruption, how to be prepared. We were told at school that in case of an eruption, we should flee immediately, and that there was a reception center in Sake that could accommodate over a million people. Unfortunately, we did not see anything on arrival. Displaced people have been found in nearby towns and even neighboring Rwanda. Some are sheltered in official buildings. Others are being helped by individuals. The volcano tremors have been reported to be reducing in intensity and regularity. The young people of Goma are now looking to the future. One day when I have money, I will leave with my whole family. I will find a good job and buy my father a house in another town far from Niragongo Volcano. Since the eruption, I can say that a lot of activities have been postponed. As students, we are stuck. We were told to wait until the governors decide that we can resume our usual activities. That is when I will feel at peace. Now, if I tell you inflation, cryptocurrency, stocks, taxes, yeah? I'm sure you know it's to do with money and you've probably heard these terms in the news or you know like grown-ups speaking about it. But what exactly do they mean? And why is it good to understand them? Let's join Kesha in Lagos. Hi Jabula. This week we're launching a series of reports about something that affects all of us, money. Understanding money and the role it plays in the economy is about more than knowing just how much you've got in your pocket. So, we're going to explain some of the key terms that you may have heard but aren't so sure about their meaning. This week, we're looking at inflation. Do reports on things like your country's budget, inflation or interest rates leave you confused? You know that they're important, but not exactly sure why. Well, we've got you covered. Simply put, inflation refers to a general and continued increase in prices over time. And by prices, we mean the cost of things like goods and services. It's measured by using an index which tracks how the price of typical items change over time. The rate of inflation is usually stated as a percentage. If prices go up, more money is now needed to buy the same items. So the value of money actually decreases when there's inflation. When inflation rises uncontrollably and gets too high, it's called hyperinflation, and it can be really bad. Let's look at a famous example. High rates of inflation mean that unless people's income increases at the same rate, they're worse off. Zimbabwe had the highest incidence of inflation in history. At the end of 2008, it reached a staggering 79 billion 600 million percent, a daily inflation rate of almost 98 percent. This happened during the financial crisis about a decade ago, when prices nearly doubled every day until the country virtually shut down. Because there were lots of water and power cuts, queues at banks and petrol stations, and severe food shortages. People had to cross into South Africa or Botswana to buy basic goods or use a barter system instead. Things got so bad that the Zimbabwean dollar was eventually scrapped altogether, and foreign currency, which is money from other countries, had to be used instead. Solving hyperinflation requires governments to put in place policies. Sometimes it means they have to drastically cut their spending, or like in the case of Zimbabwe, change their currency to a more stable one. But in any case, for most people, inflation means less money. I'll be back over the next few weeks with more reports on things like cryptocurrency, the stock markets, and more. But for now, it's back to you, Deb, in the studio. Thanks, Kesha. Now, we all know Africa has a rich cultural heritage, but did you know that an estimated 90% of African works of art are 
outside the continent. Now, many are in European museums, which are now under great pressure to return them to the countries where they were stolen from, often during the colonial era. Among the most famous objects are these bronze sculptures from Nigeria, looted in the 19th century. Some countries have started returning artifacts. In France, a law was passed for the restitution of works of art to Benin and Senegal. And our reporter in Dakar, Aisha, met two young people to see how they feel about access to their artistic heritage. Welcome to the Museum of Black Civilizations in Dakar with its structure inspired by a small round hut very common in Africa. This museum stores the only work of art officially returned by France to Africa. You wonder what it is? André and Seydina will tell you in a moment. Here we have the sword of Elad Omartal, who was a war leader and who resisted colonization and who is a symbolic figure for Muslims in the past and even today. This word was loaned by France to Senegal for five years, but was officially returned under a law passed in 2020 in France. This word was exhibited at the Musée des Invalides in France and now it is here for good at the Musée des Civilisations Noires. It's hoped the return of the sword is a first step in other pieces of traditional African art going back to where they came from originally. Another 26 pieces are due to be returned from France to Benin by the end of 2021. It's thought that uh, hundreds of thousands of cultural objects from Africa are stored in European museums. Most of these works were taken by force, either stolen or looted. Art is appreciated all over the world, and as Africans we have to know the art that was created before by our ancestors. These pieces are part of our heritage. Sidina, is access to your cultural heritage relevant for you as a young people? I would say yes, because in the end, it is our history. It is the history of young Africans. They have to know it. I only started to know my history recently. The reason is that I used to go to museums, but I didn't see much African art, so I didn't really know it. It was when I was in my teens that I started to focus on this kind of stuff, and I thought that young Africans should know the history. For me, I found out about it too late. Only how should African youth reappropriate their ancestors' works? Uh, once the works reach African soil, young people should start by saying to themselves that these works belong to us. They do not come from another country, so they are our works, they belong to us. We should learn their meanings. This is how we will find out more about our culture and be less ignorant of the African world in which we live. One argument that's been used against sending back these items is the lack of suitable museums with right infrastructures in Africa. This argument is increasingly being challenged by African countries. In recent years, new museums have been built in Benin, Côte d'Ivoire, DRC and Senegal, where we are now in this ultra-modern museum that can accommodate up to 18,000 pieces. Let's head to the Indian Ocean now, where Mauritius has launched its first ever satellite. It's the second launch by an African country this year, with Tunisia sending their own nano-satellite into space in March. So what are they used for? And why are more and more African countries building their own? We sent Nora into orbit to find out. Four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Lift off. Go Falcon, go Dragon. Mauritius has launched its first satellite into space. 
It was on board the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, which took off from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, USA. Designed by a team of Mauritian engineers, the nanosatellite will run from a ground station in Eben, just south of the Mauritian capital. So what are satellites? Satellites are machines which are launched into space and move around the Earth. And according to NASA, there are currently around 1,100 active satellites, which are both government and private owned. The first ever satellite called Sputnik 1 was launched by the Soviet Union, now known as Russia, in 1957. But the first African country to have launched a satellite into space was South Africa's Sunsat in 1999. And this year, after Tunisia, the Mauritian Mirsat 1 is Africa's second satellite in 2021, bringing the total number of African satellites to 44. Why do we need satellites? Well, for many reasons, such as improving the use of mobile phones and being able to watch more TV channels. There are environmental uses too. In South Africa, for example, its satellite monitors the weather and evaluates images of bushfires which are beneficial to farmers. So, what's next for Africa's space industry? According to Space in Africa, the African space market is worth over $7 billion annually and it's likely to grow over 40% in the next five years. This means there'll be more jobs for young people on the continent and an improvement in technology. And when it comes to the next African country launching a satellite, Egypt plans to do this at the end of December, so watch this space. If you follow us regularly, you'll remember last time we talked about the huge number of fake medicines sold in Africa and the efforts being made to tackle this problem. As part of our special series on fake medicines, we've taken a close look at some real and fake anti-malarial drugs that were bought in Nigeria. So how can you tell the difference and avoid buying fakes? We've asked an expert. Fake medicines are an issue worldwide. Earlier on this year, Interpol seized 2,400 fake COVID vaccine doses in South Africa. So what can be done to keep you and your family safe? Here we have our tablet. So we want to investigate what's actually in it. I'm Dr. Bahijo Raimi Abraham, pharmacist and lecturer in pharmaceutics at King's College London. Some fake medicines are so good, it's very difficult to tell. So we've got some anti-malarials from Nigeria that have been tested to find out the amount of active drug in there. This one is real, so it has 98.3% of the active anti-malarial drug. And then these two are fake, they have no drug in them. What is interesting is that the people who have faked these products have been, they're so good, it's really hard to tell that they're fake. They've got the holograms, they have the fake batch numbers, expiry dates. The markings, gosh, it's very sad. But when you actually look at the packaging in particular with this one, there are some spelling mistakes. Here are some other anti-malarials that have been obtained from Nigeria as well. The real product, the colors are more vibrant, more intense. The falsified product, the packaging colors are very faded and washed out. If we now look at the tablets, there's some orange specks in some of them, and this is as a result of poor mixing, so a really bad formulation process. We know that fake medicines can enter the supply chain. This unfortunately means that a medicine may not be 100% what it says it is. But there are things that you can do to minimize the risk. For safety reasons, adults should normally purchase medicines. So here are some tips you can share with your family. Make sure your family gets their medicines from a pharmacy that's regulated by your country's National Pharmacy Council or regulatory body. Most countries have a database of licensed pharmacies that you can look up online. Before you or your family take any medicines, make sure to look at the packaging. Firstly, look to make sure that the product is in date by checking the expiry date. You should also look for any spelling mistakes or any defects on the packaging. Some packaging comes with a scratch panel where you would scratch 
to reveal a pin or a number and then you would then follow the directions to call and verify that this product is real. It's important to know that criminals can also fake these. When you get your medicines, ideally you want them to be in their manufacturing packaging where you have a patient information leaflet and also the medicines are in their blister packs. Sometimes they're given like this, which is not safe because you don't know exactly what you're taking and also the stability of the medicine is compromised because it's exposed to a lot more air, humidity, uh, temperatures. If you think a medicine might be fake, make sure to ask an adult to report it to your country's relevant authority. And this is to make sure that other people aren't harmed by fake medicines. Thank you, Dr. Raimi Abraham. If you want to catch up on the other films in our series about fake drugs, just go to our YouTube channel to learn more about what they are and how teenagers in Nigeria have come up with an app to fight them. That's on youtube.com forward slash BBC What's New. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you get all the latest updates from us and we get happy when you see you there. In many countries, it's rare to see girls get an education in science and technology. Now, according to the UN Agency for Education, many girls and women are still excluded from science careers. Women make up only 28% of the world's workforce in science, technology, engineering and mathematics, or STEM. But in Ghana, a group of girls are challenging stereotypes by building robots. And this has brought them world recognition, as the BBC reporter there, Thomas Nadi, explains. You see, in the real world, in the factory, where human beings are working, people travel, people die, people move to other parts of the world, people go for events. So we decided that, okay, robots can do this work. And we built this prototype of the factory. 16-year-old Jessica developed an interest in science when she was a young girl and later became interested in robotics at the Methodist Girls High School. We need a lot of support. We need printers, not just hard copy printers. We need 3D printers, we need computers, we need kits, robotics kits for building more of these. Because this robot right there, we could have built two or three, but we have just a few kits, so we could build only one. Located in the town of Mamfe in southeastern Ghana, the Methodist Girls High School's robotic lab was created eight years ago and has 55 girls from different fields of study, including arts. The team has won two global robotics competitions, the RoboFest in 2019 and recently the Codex for Coding Virtual Robots. But what's the secret? This is discovery-based learning. Allow the children to use the skill they have, the knowledge they've apart from classroom, to solve a world problem. I don't teach, I don't talk much, I give them the problem to solve. When they get to a point where it becomes difficult, that is when I come in. In Ghana, few girls study science, technology, engineering and mathematics, STEM subjects, partly due to the misconception that the subjects are for boys and also due to lack of adequate resources and trained teachers in the field. The government has said it's taking a special interest in the Manfi Methodist Girls High School. We want Manfi Methodist Girls to become a full-fledged STEM senior high school. So it's something that I'm excited about, uh, so that it can become a future pipeline for the training of engineers and other related STEM professionals. Back at the Methodist Girls High School, students like Jessica are busy building robots. Despite all the challenges, Jessica and her colleagues hope to become the next generation of computer engineers to transform the IT industry in this country and inspire others across the continent. Oh, that's all from the BBC What's New team this week. But we'll see you next time. Bye.